Welcome to our webinar series on thrombosis and hemostasis. I'm Jeff Barnes from the University of Michigan, a member of the ISTH Education and Outreach Committee, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Today, we will be discussing thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura, new insights in pathogenesis and treatment modalities with Professors Bernhard Lamla and Spiro Catalan. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, and we encourage you to submit questions to our presenters using the question and answer box at the bottom left of your screen. Please feel free to submit your questions at any time. We will be monitoring these questions and will try to respond more quickly if something should not wait. Otherwise, we will address them directly in the question and answer period at the end of the webinar. When asking your question, please specify which speaker you would like to address the question to. I would also like to point out a few unique features for those who wish to take notes during the presentation. When you click on the tab on the right slide that's labeled open, you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the presentation. If you're interested in a PDF copy of the PowerPoint, you can click on the resources icon in the lower left of the player. Click on any of the file names to initiate a download. Also, if you experience any technical problems during the course of the webinar, you can click on the help icon located on the right side of the chat box. We have a technical expert there to help out with any problems you may have. On the home panel, there's also a tab labeled technical support that will list a phone number in case you need to handle your issues over the phone. So why don't we go ahead and get started? First up is Dr. Lamla, who will discuss current insights and pathogenesis of TTP. Okay, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. My name is Bernhard Lemle. I am an emeritus professor of the Department of Hematology at the University of Bern in Switzerland, and I'm now working as a guest professor and senior consultant at the Center for Thrombosis and Hemostasis at University Medical Center in Mainz. Here, my disclosures are employed by the Center of Thrombosis and Hemostasis in Mainz. I have a research grant from Baxter Biosciences for the Hereditary TTP Registry, which is an investigator-initiated research, and I am currently on the Data Safety Monitoring Board for the Bax930 study, which is the treatment of recombinant human, um, uh, treatment with recombinant human ADMTS13 in patients with a hereditary deficiency. This study is planned to go ahead uh, uh, in the next few weeks. So, uh, I start with a short overview on the history of TTP. 1924, Moschkowitz reported on a young girl dying after a few uh, days of severe acute illness out of good health. She died and the autopsy only showed the problem. She had a diffuse microvascular thrombotic disease in many, many organs. And the cause was not known, of course. In 1947, Singer you, uh, saw a few and reported on a few similar cases and created the name thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, highlighting the pathophysiology, namely the consumption of platelets in the microvascular thrombotic uh, process as the reason for the thrombocytopenia, as opposed to ITP, where no thrombosis was seen. In 1955, a very similar disease uh, was reported by Gasser, which is still now called the hemolytic uremic syndrome. And in 1966, Amorosi and Ultmann defined the PENTAT, defining TTP. And this is a uh, um, combination of microangiopathic hemolytic anemia with fragmented red cells, thrombocytopenia, neurologic signs and symptoms, renal dysfunction, and fever. The mortality in these early days was almost 100%, and over the years, many pathophysiological hypotheses were put forward to try to explain this disease, and I am not having time to go into detail. You can um, uh, see these, uh, um, uh, these uh, ideas on the pathophysiology on the slide. I am going to one important pathophysiological hypothesis now, which was first reported by Jo 
Joel Moak and co-workers in 1982 in the New England Journal of Medicine, and they found unusually large von Willebrand factor multimers in a few patients with a chronic relapsing form of TTP, and these were present mainly in remission. You see in the panel patient A, REM, this means remission, and you see at the upper part, these unusually large uh, von Willebrand factor multimers, which were not present in N, normal plasma, and they also disappeared when the patient had an acute relapse. They were, as we know today, consumed in the microvascular thrombotic process because these sticky multimers clumped the platelet, uh, platelets together. And you can see also in the left hand part the endothelial culture supernatant, which also contains, in contrast to normal plasma, these unusually large multimers. In 1997, our group in Bern with uh, Miha Furlan as the first author reported on a lacking von Willebrand factor cleaving protease in four patients with such a chronic relapsing form of TTP, confirming um, the uh, finding of um, of Joel Moak. And you can see here from these early studies a panel of von Willebrand factor multimer analysis on SDS agarose gels. And you see a patient with two blood samples, one and two, and his brother also affected by a chronic relapsing form of TTP. And you can see at the upper part where, is, where this double arrow is highlighting them, these are the unusually large multimers not present in the mother, in the father, sisters, or normal plasma. Now, one year before, we had discovered, together with Tsai in New York, a protease which cleaves the von Willebrand factor at the position tyrosine Y842, methionine 143, and of course we wondered whether a deficiency of this protease could possibly explain the presence of these unusually large von Willebrand factor multimers. And please note, this protease was a new protease, not known so far, but the cleavage site had been identified by isolating von Willebrand factor from plasma of normal subjects. So, of course, we looked at these patients, and you see here, not the von Willebrand factor in the patient plasmas, but you see here purified von Willebrand factor, which had been degraded, incubated with the diluted plasma of patient affected brother, mother, father, sister, and normal plasma. And you can easily see there is absolutely no degradation uh, of the von Willebrand factor substrate by the plasma of patient and brother, whereas mother's and father's plasma showed a slight reduction of the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease and normal plasma and sister's plasma had, of course, normal activity. So this was a demonstration then of a lacking von Willebrand factor cleaving protease activity in these two brothers with a chronic relapsing form of TTP. And the question was, of course, if this a unique specific finding for this family or is this a more general finding? And we had uh, analyzed very shortly a large number of patient plasmas and we uh, I have summarized on this slide the general finding. A severe deficiency of this newly discovered von Willebrand factor cleaving protease activity due to autoantibodies was seen in most patients with an acute non-familiar form of TTP. And the similar, a similar report has been uh, provided by Tsai and Lian, and actually these two papers were uh, published in the same issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. A severe deficiency of the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease without an inhibitor was found in three pairs of siblings with a familial form of TTP, as the two brothers I have just shown you, and a normal von Willebrand factor cleaving protease was found in most patients with an atypical familial or non-familial form.
syndrome of hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is clinically a very similar disease to TTP, and this was astonishing for us. Now, let me continue with the next slide. This protease over the years has been more clearly defined. Gerritsen, Fujikawa, so Ejima, Zeng purified the protein from plasma. Gerritsen is from our group in Bern with Mia Furlan as the principal investigator. And the protein purification allowed a sequence analysis and this led to the protein structure and chromosomal localization to chromosome 9Q34 and the name ADMTS13, which stands for a disintegrin-like and metalloprotease with thrombospondin type 1 domains number 13 because um, uh, 12 also similar proteases had been defined before. In uh, the same year, Levy et al. used a different approach. They did a genome-wide linkage analysis in families with a hereditary form of TTP, just a few families, and they found exactly the same gene, ADMTS13, and found 12 different mutations in their um, patients, accounting for 14 or 15 disease alleles in their families. Shortly thereafter, Kokame et al. from Japan reported on different mutations in two families with hereditary TTP in Japan. And one year later, in 2002, Plymauer was able to express the recombinant ADMTS13 as a functional protein in mammalian cells. Here you can see the ADMTS13 gene structure in A, 29 exons. B shows the protein structure with a signal peptide, propeptide, metalloprotease domain, disintegrin domain with a first thrombospondin type 1 domain, cystine-rich spacer domain, seven additional thrombospondin type 1 domains and two cup domains. And in row C, you see already the first analysis from uh, Levy et al. in these few families shows that the missense or splice site or frame shift mutations found in the patients, they are spread over the whole gene. An update in 2010 gave 76 mutations uh, um, as a cause, as, as causal mutations or possibly causal mutations in various patients with hereditary TTP and from Japan, 43 Japanese patients with different mutations have been analyzed and published in 2011. Now you can see here a picture from a very nice publication by Akiyama and Toji Miyata in the PNS in 2009. It's a little bit difficult to explain it without a pointer. In panel A, you can see the von Willebrand factor, the A2 domain of the von Willebrand factor in a folded, um, in a folded uh, state. This is on the right side, and you can see the cleavage site, Y, 1605, M1606, by the way, this is the numbering of the amino acid sequence, including the propeptide, and you can see the cleavage site is buried in this uh, globular protein structure. If, however, there is shear stress, and this is to the left side, the von Willebrand factor A2 domain is stretched, and the cleavage site at Y1605, M1606 is becoming accessible, and on the right side in B, you can see the metalloprotease disintegrin thrombospondin type 1, number 1, uh, cystine-rich spacer domain, so this is the amino terminal half of the ADMTS13 protein, and you can see how the von Willebrand factor cleavage site is exactly adjusted to uh, come to the metalloprotease, to the, the metalloprotease active site, and you see that there are several exocytes labeled as exocyte 1, 2, and 3 on the ADMTS13 where the von Willebrand factor uh, uh, contacts the, uh, the ADMTS13 and the protease is able so to cleave only this elongated von Willebrand factor molecule. The 
search of animal models to uh, TTP uh, showed that the ADMTS-13 deficient mice, knockout mice, created by Motto and David Ginsberg were viable, astonishingly. They had a normal lifespan and it needed the introduction of a hyphen relevant factor genetic background to get some thrombocytopenia decreased survival. But to bring about a Acute disease, like in an acute TTP, a shiga toxin challenge was needed. In the ADMTS-13 deficient mice in, uh, created in Japan, in Toshimiyata's lab, similar situation, there were unusually large von Willebrand factor molecules in the plasma of these mice. There was a prothrombotic condition, but no spontaneous TTP. In the baboon model reported from Karen van Horelbeke's lab by Pfizer et al., Adam TS13 inhibition by a monoclonal antibody inactivating Adam TS13, there was in the baboon model a uh, resulting TTP-like disease, and this, of course, is rather a model of the acquired form of TTP. Finally, Adam TS13 knockout mice by, uh, reported by Schiewitz et al. two years ago, their recombinant human von Willebrand factor challenge at high doses, leading to a very high von Willebrand factor concentration, led in these mice to a TTP-like disease. And importantly, recombinant human Adam TS13 was effective either when given prophylactically before the challenge or therapeutically after the von Willebrand factor challenge. Now, let me just give you an overview of the thrombotic microangiopathies that we can distinguish now in 2014. There is a rare hereditary form of TTP with a severe constitutional ADMTS 13 deficiency. This is also called the upshaw schulman syndrome. There is more frequently an acquired form idiopathic TTP with a severe acquired autoantibody-induced ADMTS-13 deficiency, and we always, if we are clinicians, encounter patients with a very similar picture, an acquired idiopathic TTP, but with the current methods, we do not find a severe ADMTS-13 deficiency. Then there is a whole array of thrombotic microangiopathies associated, for instance, with hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, disseminated neoplasia, certain drugs, pregnancy, including the HELP syndrome, HIV infection, severe hypertension, connective tissue disease, and these are a very, very, this is a very heterogeneous group of diseases. Some of them may have an uh, ADMTS-13 deficiency associated with others have a completely different pathophysiology. Atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome is nowadays and uh, has been recognized to be often associated with complement regulatory protein defects. About half of the patients have such a complement regulatory protein defect. And more commonly, the typical HUS, mainly in children, is the diarrhea positive hemolytic uremic syndrome caused by this enteropathogenic. And um, Escherichia coli, mainly of the uh, O157H7 serotype. Now, let me go to some more details of the hereditary TTP. Opshaw, in 1978, who gave the name to the Opshaw Schulman syndrome, found a recurring microangiopathic hemolytic anemia and thrombocytopenia in a young woman who responded very well to plasma infusion. And this missing plasma factor, he postulated, is clearly the Adam TS13 as we know it now, the von Willebrand factor cleaving protease. It is very important if you are pediatricians that you avoid misdiagnosis. For instance, misdiagnosis of a hyperactivity attention deficit syndrome of ITP or Coombs negative even syndrome. Variable clinical picture. It has to be recognized that not all people start their disease at um, an early onset in the first few years. About half of the hereditary TTP cases have their first frank TTP bout at an age of 
over 20 years. And I would like to highlight this hereditary TTP registry we have set up in uh, Bern together with several investigators from different places in the world. You find here the net, uh, the, the, the web uh, address, and you can uh, please, if you have such patients, uh, register them in this registry. This is the way how we learn more about this very uh, rare orphan disease. Compound heterozygous or homozygous ADMTS13 mutations are found in all patients with a, a clinical diagnosis of uh, hereditary TTP. There are many different ADMTS13 mutations spread over the whole um, gene, as I told you before, and these are usually individual mutations, so only seen in several individual families. There are two exceptions to this rule, the mutation of 4143 INS A and arginine 1060, um, uh, arginine 1060 tryptophan mutation, which, is, uh, which both have a higher prevalence in the Caucasian population, so they are also found in unrelated families. There is the idea that the various age of disease onset and the severity difference in the disease may be partly related to the residual ADMTS13 activity. For instance, this R1060W mutation, if you are homozygous for this, you may still have some 5 to 10% of ADMTS13 activity, and this may be protective at the young age and mainly um, in, um, in adult patients, the, this, uh, there is a first disease uh, bout, and this is very often triggered, for instance, by pregnancy. Here you can, um, uh, I want to make some comments on the acquired TTP, which is more common, autoimmunity to ADMTS13. How does this autoimmunity, um, uh, how is it uh, generated? There are risk factors for autoimmunization. There is in uh, France and in England, uh, described by Coppo and Scully, an HLA um, DRB111 allele seems to be a risk allele for such an autoimmunity, and maybe there is also a um, certain um, uh, pathogenetic influence of the ADMTS13 uh, ADM gene variability between the two alleles that could have a role in autoimmunity. We are actively researching on this. The epitope of autoantibodies inhibiting the ADMTS13 activity seems to lie here, uh, what you see in the spacer domain. This is the red part of the molecule, and we have usually in patients a polyclonal autoimmunity with polyclonal IgG antibodies, very often IgG4, more than IgG1 and IgG2, and more than IgG3. And these antibodies have not only this uh, epitope in the space domain, but there are epitopes in other domains of the ADMTS13 and the the, the pathophysiologic effect of these different antibodies is not yet fully understood. Now, I would like to highlight from a recent paper by Ferrari et al. some uh, interesting findings. It is difficult for me without a pointer to show you everything. You have here 18 patients having with an acute acquired TTP having been examined in acute disease phase and then in remission months or even years apart. And you can see that the ADMTS13 activity upper left panel increases in most patients, but some patients, despite getting into clinical remission, remain deficient. And then the ADMTS13 antigen uh, second panel in, in A uh, has the same direction, normalization in some patients, whereas the ADMTS13 inhibitor decreases and the IgG autoantibodies Free antibodies binding to ADMTS13 decrease in remission, but you can see already here that several people, even if they are many months in complete remission, re uh, retain some IgG 
anti adam tr 13 antibodies. And in the lowest panel, you see immune complexes, circulating immune complexes between IgG1 and adam tr 13 IgG2, IgG3, and IgG4. Um, uh, adam tr 13 immune complexes. And you can see that in remission, a substantial number of the patients still has such circulating immune complexes, mainly of the IgG4 type. Now, concerning the pathogenesis, both of hereditary and acquired TTP, the question can be asked, is there a second hit needed? Because some people remain for a very lo a long time, for a long time, in a complete remission despite a severe adam 13 deficiency, both acquired and hereditary. Pregnancy is a frequent trigger of a first disease bout in the hereditary form of TTP, whereas in acquired TTP, acute pancreatitis has been reported in a few patients as a trigger clearly preceding the TTP. So not pancreatitis, ischemic pancreatitis as a consequence of TTP, but it seemed in several patients to trigger the TTP. Mild infection is very often um, uh, present before, a few days before an acute TTP bout, and we did a study together with Tobias Fuchs and, um, and Denisa Wagner in Boston, where we wondered whether neutrophil extracellular traps, nets, and their degradation product uh, would be maybe a manifestation or an expression of such a second hit. And we found elevated nucleosomes containing DNA, uh, nuclear DNA and histones, as well as DNA and myeloperoxidase in plasma during acute disease bouts. And I show you uh, two pictures on this. You can see here our determination of plasma nucleosomes in panel A and plasma DNA in panel B in controls with the normal range in this hatched uh, area, and you can see acute TMA patients, be it acute acquired TTP, acute HUS, or tumor-associated, or, or not otherwise specified acute TMAs, had in many cases elevated levels of nucleosomes and DNA. Please note the ordinate is a logarithmic scale. And then you can see here, this is uh, uh, just a focus on five patients where we had paired samples, acute TTP, and then after remission induced by plasma exchange therapy and steroids, a normalization of plasma DNA during remission, also a normalization of the LDH activity in panel H. In panel I, the plasma myeloperoxidase has a tendency to normalize, not normalized in every patient, and the uh, neutrophil release product plasma S100A8, A9, calprotectin, shows also a normalization. So we felt that these nucleosomes or DNA might be a reflection of a second hit. I conclude and give you a perspective. The pathophysiology of TTP there is a definite role of adam 13 deficiency. I think this is a very important risk factor, but clearly there are other players and leukocytes, complement activation, I didn't talk about this, several cytokines and maybe coagulation activation can have a role in bringing about acute disease. I would like to highlight it is very important that we recognize hereditary TTP, mainly in children, but also in adults, and this is crucial to avoid unnecessary death. Prediction prophylaxis of recurrence in acquired and hereditary TTP, in uh, acquired and hereditary Adam tr 13 deficiency is of utmost importance, and for this we need large multicentric prospective studies. And I would like to mention for all people being enthusiastic researchers and clinicians for uh, TTP, there are still many, many open research questions, 
and I would just acknowledge many, many um, collaborators and uh, people with whom I have worked together, my group in Bern with Johanna Kremer, Miha Furlan, and now my new group in Mainz with Karis von Auer, Tanja Falter, and um, uh, others, and I do not go through all these uh, different people. I acknowledge all physicians and hospitals having sent patient plasma samples so we could learn a lot on this disease. And I thank you for listening to me. Thank you, Dr. Lamo. That was a wonderful review. Uh, as a reminder to everyone, we ask you to post your questions in the Q&A box, and we will address those at the end of the presentation. So now we're going to continue. Uh, Dr. Catalan will discuss new treatment options for TTP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Lemley, for a very interesting uh, and, I would say, enlightening presentation. What I would like to talk about are some of the new treatment options, approaches to treatment, as well as follow-up in patients with, with TTP. And I think there's some interesting um, development. Uh, disclosure, I do serve as a consultant to the Ablings Corporation, um, who is involved with the development of the ALX0081 or Caplicizumab. Um, Nana, by that, we'll be talking about a little bit later in the presentation. So I think the, the diagnosis of TTP, the clinical diagnosis of TTP, I think, is familiar to everyone in the audience. It's the presence of a thrombocytopenia, uh, microangiopathic changes, fragmented cells, schistocytes, uh, typically anemia, uh, without an alternative clinical explanation, which I think is key. Uh, a deficiency, a severe deficiency of the Adam TS13 protease is not required for the diagnosis, but it certainly confirms the clinical diagnosis uh, and works well to really identify um, patients for the purposes of clinical study uh, as well as laboratory investigation. Plasma exchange therapy remains the mainstay of therapy for TTP, um, be it the removal of the autoantibody inhibitors and acquired TTP or the addition um, of the functional protease. Usually continue daily until the platelet count and LDH are normal. Uh, you also would like to see at least stabilization or if not improvement of end organ injury present. In addition to plasma exchange therapy, it's quite common and routine to add uh, adjuvant immune suppressive therapy, most commonly corticosteroids. The idea being you're targeting the production of the anti adam TS13 antibody uh, while you're removing it, uh, trying to, uh, again, prevent early as well as late recurrences of TTP. In the category of immune suppressive therapies um, and immune modulating therapies, rituximab, I think, is familiar to most investigators as it is quite commonly used in patients with acquired TTP. Um, it is a monoclonal anti-CD20 antibody targeting B lymphocytes. So this will quite rapidly, usually within a week, um, clear circulating B cells. Uh, the mechanism of action thought to be suppression of the anti, the production of the anti-ADAM TS13 antibodies. Responses typically occur in one to two weeks. Uh, and this figure here is shown on the right, taken from a publication from Marie Scully. Uh, where the use of rituximab was, was started within the first three days of their presentation. Um, you can see really in the first week and especially into the second week on day 15, um, the dashed line showing the decreased IgG uh, anti-ADAM anti TS13 inhibitor declining after therapy or during therapy, I should say, while in the solid line seeing the rise in the ADAM TS13 activity, what you might expect. Um, in a responding patient. There are some data that suggest there may be a modulation of the T cell compartment as well as T regulatory cells that may play a part as well in the mechanism of action of rituximab. So there's clearly a lot of experience with rituximab and acquired TTP, especially patients with refractory um, and chronic relapsing TTP. The data that's available certainly suggests uh, you can delay relapses if not prevent them um, with treatment with rituximab. Relapses seem to be associated with the recurrence of the anti adam TS13 antibodies. Uh, <clears throat> the data, though, are not randomized in placebo controlled studies. If we look at the uh, other uses of the rituximab, which have uh, emerged recently, and a report from He et al. from the French Thrombotic Microangiopathy Group looked at the use of preemptive 
rituximab therapy in the absence of clinical disease just with recurrence of a severe deficiency of Adam TS13. Um, in 48 patients uh, with at least one previous TTP episode, 30 patients received preemptive rituximab therapy. Uh, the recurrence rate, the relapse rate, was certainly decreased significantly in these patients compared to those who did not receive the preemptive or prophylactic rituximab therapy. So certainly, rituximab is a very efficacious at in, in clearing the Adam TS-15 inhibitors, decreasing the production. I think the primary question that really needs to be uh, answered is the selection of those patients most likely to benefit. As you've already heard from Professor Lemley, typically there's a second hit that's required. Adam TS-13 activity being severely deficient in remission is clearly a risk factor for recurrent TTP but it does not mean absolutely a recurrence is going to occur. So more work needs to be certainly undertaken to understand those patients most likely to benefit from uh, initial as well as preemptive therapy for rituximab. In turn to rituximab as the initial therapy of CTP, a very interesting study done by Marie Scully and her colleagues in the UK looked at 40 patients with acute CTP who were treated within the first three days of presentation with rituximab combined with plasma exchange therapy with the results compared to historical control. Clinical outcomes certainly seem to suggest a decreased inpatient hospital stay, but really I would suggest that the, the bigger benefit, really the goal of this therapy is to reduce the relapse rate in patients going forward, less so the initial or acute recovery. And as you can see in this slide from their publication, the relapse rate uh, in the rituximab arm was 10%, um, going out 50 to 60 months, with a median time to relapse of 27 months in these patients. Compared to the historical controls, that showed a relapse rate of 57%, with a median time to relapse of approximately 18 months. So these were age-matched, sex, and clinically-matched controls. So certainly, I would take very provocative data, um, but again, not not randomized, not prospective, but certainly for a rare disease, very important, and I would say impressive data. If we continue with the theme of trying to prevent future relapses of TTP, splenectomy has certainly uh, been talked about, discussed, and undertaken for many years, and I think there's some very interesting data on splenectomy. Uh, and one particular retrospective study uh, reported by Capris Clune uh, should looked at 24 patients who underwent splenectomy for relapsed TTP. Now, again, this was a retrospective study of consecutively admitted patients uh, to referral centers in the Netherlands from January 1982 through May of 2002. These patients certainly had a clinical phenotype of the chronic relapsing TTP with a median number of pre-splenectomy relapses of two with a range of one to nine. And a very long follow-up, I would tell you, uh, a mean of 111 months with some patients followed as long as 230 months. Relapse rates of 25% or six of the 24 uh, were reported, uh, and with relapses occurring a median of 15 months, which is certainly a significant reduction in the relapse rate uh, from a pre splenectomy rate of 0.74 relapses per patient year uh, going down to 0 0.10 relapses per patient year post splenectomy. These same data uh, from the article from Capra's Clue are also combined with nine patients treated in, uh, reported in the same report, but that were treated for refractory TTP. So what you're seeing here are 33 patients um, and a Kaplan-Meier relapse-free survival curve, showing the 10-year relapse-free survival rate to be approximately 70%. So certainly very interesting, and I think provocative data, suggesting uh, that these data could be considered comparable uh, to rituximab in terms of preventing um, recurrence is very much analogous to how we use splenectomy in patients with ICP. Um, Dr. Dubois and colleagues also uh, reported a series of five patients who underwent splenectomy for relapsing TTP, um, as well as looking um, at other reports and doing a meta-analysis and looking at 87 patients they found five of the 87 or 17 percent um, relapsed uh, after splenectomy. And you can see underlined in these slides the larger series represented where the follow-up was quite adequate. 
uh, and long enough, I think, to pick up a large number. Uh, and nearly all relapses that can occur. So certainly, collectively, uh, these data suggest that scolectomy may be another reasonable treatment option uh, to prevent um, recurrences, relapses of PCP. So we change up here just a little bit and start talking about the upfront, tre upfront treatment uh, of TTP and some of the newer approaches to therapy. Um, ARC-1779 is a nucleic acid macromolecule, or an aptamer, uh, that binds specifically to the A1 domain of von Willebrand factor, um, the hypothesis being by preventing the interaction of von Willebrand factor to platelet-like glycoprotein 1B, you're going to inhibit the prothrombotic function of von Willebrand factor. So changing someone to a, from a prothrombotic pro state uh, to somewhere where there could be sort of a mild bleeding diathesis. Uh, potentially by inhibiting the function of our factor. But certainly there's a benefit theoretically outweighing the risk of this profound prothrombotic state. Uh, it, it was hypothesized that you should see shorter courses of plasma exchange um, to achieve a normal plate account. Uh, imply that you're going to have fewer or decreasing microthrombi form uh, more quickly. Um, hopefully having decreased end organ complications long term as one of the potential benefits long-term of the quicker recovery from their acute TTP episode. This study was a double-blinded placebo-controlled study with a three-to-one randomization. Um, all patients received daily plasma exchange. The patients randomized to the ARC-1779 received an IV loading dose of 0.21 milligrams per kilogram. Um, followed by a maintenance infusion of 0.6 micrograms per kilogram per minute. Patients also received a reloading dose of 50% of their initial loading dose after each plasma exchange to replace what was potentially removed during the plasma exchange therapy. Now, unfortunately, not due to safety reasons, but more financial reasons, the study was stopped after nine patients were enrolled, seven patients um, on the treatment arm, the study arm, two on the placebo control arm. But I think even though that's too small of an arm to really derive any meaningful analysis of clinical outcomes, there was some interesting data that did emerge. Um, one thing that was looked at was the relative von Willebrand factor activity. This is not a true uh, functional activity, uh, but a measurement of, of available A1 domain binding site that was correlated to the von Willebrand factor functional activity. Um, in the red, you can see the concentrations of ARC1779, and which corresponds in an indirect relationship with the increasing concentrations, a decline and a decrease uh, in the relative von Willebrand factor activity during the infusions, which was maintained during the infusion. After the infusion was stopped, uh, you see a rise and a return of the functional von Willebrand factor activity, if you will, um, back to baseline state. It's also important to measure that during this suppression, this inhibition of VWF function, there were no significant uh, or serious bleeding complications appreciated, which is certainly was a concern um, in a population of patients known to be thrombocytopenic and potentially at risk of bleeding. The follow-up study uh, to the ARC-1779 has recently been stopped and the initial data um, released. This was a phase two study of ALX0081 or capilocizumab. Um, and this study was a phase two as it states here in acquired TTP patients. Um, it's similar to um, the ARC1779. This uh, capilocizumab is an antibody that binds to the A1 domain site, preventing the interaction, as you can see in the slide, the, the image on the left, preventing the interaction of, of von Willebrand factor with platelets, again, preventing the formation of these microthrombi, um, hopefully resulting in a quicker recovery of the platelet count and a prevention of end organ injury or a minimization at least. This was a single-blinded study with a one-to-one -one randomization. Um, again, just as in the previous study, all patients received daily plasma exchange therapy until remission. Uh, I didn't mention earlier uh, but should have immune suppressive therapy uh, in this study, as well as the ARC study, were allowed and were determined at the discretion of the treating physician. In this study, the patients randomized to the capilocizumab arm, or the ALX0081, uh, received a 10-milligram IV loading dose, 
followed by a daily 10 milligram subcutaneous dosing until remission, uh, until the stopping of plasma exchange therapy. After plasma exchange therapy, patients on the study arm continued for 30 days after the last plasma exchange. I think a very important point that it helps to address uh, this exacerbation rate or the risk of recurrence in the first 30 days uh, after stopping plasma exchange therapy, at least potentially um, addressing the protective effect that this uh, molecule could have in patients. If we look at the preliminary data that has been released to date, a total of 75 subjects were enrolled between January 2011 uh, and January 2014. And there, there was a 39% reduction in the time to a normal platelet count compared to the placebo arm of the study. Uh, I think even more impressive, there was 73% less exacerbation in the capitalism at arm. Equally important, there was a manageable increase in bleeding tendency, but not thought to be serious bleeding issues. We switch into recombinant atom testing to talk briefly, uh, and, and Professor Lemley already mentioned some of this work already, but I think it's very interesting and deserves further mention. There are preclinical models, as you've already heard, looking at the prophylactic administration of recombinant atom TS13 uh, that was protected in a mouse model. It was also studied uh, in in vitro studies of human plasma samples with a linear relationship between the inhibitor titer and the recombinant atom TS13 activity concentration uh, needed uh, to reconstitute the von Willebrand factor cleaving uh, activity. So suggesting that in addition to its potential role in congenital TCP to replace this missing protease, um, suggesting that you can actually overcome an inhibitor. So it may even be, have some utility in patients with acquired TCP to overwhelm the ability of the inhibitor to bind to the recombinant MTS-13. And what I think is a very ingenious uh, modification um, of the idea of recombinant atom TS-13 is work uh, reported by Gian et al. from uh, the lab of Dr. Long Zeng at the University of Pennsylvania. And as you heard from Professor Lemley already, the majority of TCP, TCP patients will have IgG autoantibodies that bind to the spacer donate, domain, which is critical for the recognition and proteolysis of von Willebrand factor. Um, what Gian et al. and colleagues did was create 24 um, Adam TS13 variants. Uh, studied them and found that two of these variants actually had an increased specific activity against the VWF73, which is the fragment used in most um, Adam TS13 assays, uh, but also increased specificity against multimeric von Willebrand factor. As well, because of this modification, it was more resistant to inhibition by Adam TS13 autoantibodies via the reduced binding by these IgGs. So, certainly, very ingenious modification. Of, of the Adam TS13, recombinant Adam TS13 uh, protease. So, although this is a talk about treatment, I think this is still a very important topic to bring up as we're still talking about treatment of patients, but now talking about treatment um, in convalescence as they're recovering. And I think this is fascinating work uh, published uh, by Dr. George and the group um, at the University of Oklahoma looking at major morbidities and mortality during long term follow up in patients with a history of acquired TTP. Um, 70 patients with a history of Adam TS13 deficiency at presentation um, that were enrolled to the Oklahoma TTP HUS registry um, were considered for the analysis. 57 patients survived and were followed uh, for morbidities and mortality. Um, and what you can see in the second line from the top um, the dotted, the dotted lines above and below representing the 95% confidence interval is the increasing probability of death in patients with a history of acquired TTP, TTP mediated by Adam TS13 deficiency, uh, compared to U.S. and Oklahoma norms, which are really flat on the bottom. Um, they found an increased prevalence of hypertension and major depression uh, in patients with a previous, previous history of TTP. But I think what was most sobering was the increased risk of dying after a previous diagnosis of TTP uh, in this cohort that was followed. Now, I, this has given um, many patients, my patient, as we've talked about these data, some difficulty, understandably. But I think it's important to look deeper into the causes of that. 
certainly the age of the patients at death is a quite a young population of patients, many in the 40s and 50s. Um, but if you look at the causes of death of these 11 patients, only two were deaths related to active uh, or recently active TTP. Uh, the other causes of death being cerebrovascular accidents, cardiac disease, uh, many other medical problems, which may be common, but maybe not so common in patients of this age group. I think raising the attention and the awareness uh, to physicians who treat patients with TTP, that they may need to be treated uh, more carefully, followed more carefully, and it's not uh, just enough to get a normal platelet count um, and let them go during follow-up. Along the same lines, we've done some work uh, in cooperation with our colleagues in London, Marie Scully, uh, in the UK TTP group, looking at long-term complications in TTP patients, specifically neurocognitive deficit um, in 27 patients um, followed in remission. These were not; these were patients that were evaluated that were functioning normally uh, with their activity, activities of daily living. They underwent MRIs as well as quality of life surveys. And what we're going to talk about here, this COG state neurocognitive test, which is performed on a laptop, and I'll explain in more detail in the next slide. What was remarkable and really confirmed what we've been seeing in our patients clinically is 63% of patients, or 17 of these 27, um, demonstrated severe cognitive dysfunction in at least two domains, uh, and primarily those of visual learning and uh, memory being most prominent. To describe in better detail what this test was, this was a laptop-based test using playing cards. Uh, and they were shown a card and asked certain questions. And the, at the bottom far left column, the detection task, they were asked if the card has turned over yet. So they have to recognize this and react to what they're seeing. The second, the IDN is the identification task, asked a question such as, is the card red? The one back learning, um, OBK, as you see in the third column, and asked a question such as, does the card exactly match the one before it, testing the short-term memory? And along these same lines, the OCL, or one-card learning uh, test, they were asked the question, have you seen this card before in this task? And if you see in red, shown, these are the performance uh, in terms compared to controls um, in patients with a history of TMA or TTP in this study population. Compared to depression, uh, a 0.08% blood alcohol content, as well as dementia. The most profound, really different, an abnormality in the TMA patients being in the one-card learning, which is what, what has been seen in the previous work uh, by Dr. George and colleagues, and really fits clinically with what we see in patients with short-term memory issues, uh, being forgetful, if you will, and having to be told several times the same thing. So very nicely, I think, uh, putting into objective data some of the things that we've seen uh, in patients clinically. So in summary, I think the future is getting brighter for patients with TTP and several new treatment approaches, including uh, capillacizumab, as well as the recombinant modified ADMTS. I think we need to learn more about the treatment options to prevent relapses, the most effective use of those. But I guess primarily the biggest question is who is going to benefit most of them, who requires this therapy, um, and who can just be followed going forward. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Catalan. That was very informative. Uh, we're going to start with the question and answer period. We've had a number of questions submitted, and I encourage you to keep submitting those. We will not be able to get to all of them today, but we will try and answer as many as possible. And those that we do not answer, we will try and uh, inform you either by email or by posting responses uh, and sending them out to all the webinar participants. So I'd like to start with Dr. Lumley. Um, going back to Adams TES 13, can you give a little bit of an overview of how that's actually detected clinically and how do you use that from a diagnostic standpoint? There have been questions about are there cutoff levels that you use? How does that play into your diagnostic algorithm? Okay, thank you for this question. It's a difficult one, and I think uh, I would fully agree that it would be a good idea to put our answers then um, maybe on the web also or uh, answering by email. I think a severe deficiency is something like less than 5% or maybe less than 10% of LMTS-13 activity, but please note our current assay technology may not detect the full in vivo function of 
the Adam T S thirteen, which in vivo has to act under flow conditions at a high shear stress. So I would m- certainly not exclude a TTP just um, uh, in a patient fulfilling the clinical signs and uh, symptoms and having maybe an ADMTS 13 activity which is not severely depressed with um, our current assay technology. This is um, a, a clear um, uh, meaning uh, I would, would have that we should not make our treatment dependent on the ADMTS 13 value. And also many labs will not be able to provide uh, within a few hours an ADMTS 13 activity assay. Let me put it this way. Wonderful. And then when somebody is getting treatment, is there any utility for following the ADMTS 13 levels during the course of their treatment, say periodically as they're getting plasma exchange? Of course, if you can do that on a research basis, and that's what we did in many, many patients, this will help you to see whether you still have an autoantibody. Uh, let's say you have a plasma exchange of three liters in a 70 kilogram patient. You get maybe a measurable ADMTS 13 activity. If a few hours later you have again zero activity, you know that you still have this uh, inhibitor, this uh, ADMTS 13 inhibitor uh, autoantibody uh, inactivating ADMTS 13 in your plasma. It may help, but the Treatment using plasma exchange, steroids, and as uh, Dr. Catalan mentioned, rituxima maybe will should not be um, mainly um, determined or guided by the ADMTS 13 activity in the usual hospital setting where there is not a research laboratory um, doing these assays every day. I would agree. I would also just add briefly that it's well known. Um, in some of our work and other people's work, that recovery of Adam TS13 activity is not not required for a clinical remission. So it may not be a direct connection between replacing the Adam TS13 function uh, and recovery. There may be other factors involved. Now, extending that, um, uh, Dr. Catalan, how do you determine when somebody is a plasma exchange non-responder? What, what factors help you determine that? And then are there risk implications as far as uh, relapse rates and all of that? You know, it, it can be very subjective. And most of the time, we've tried to just define these in some of our prospective studies. Um, what we'll typically use is a three days consistent three consecutive days with a rising LDH, a declining platelet count, and progressive end organ injury will really get our attention as a patient that's poorly responding. If I'm honest with you, we can usually see the problems before we get to three days. And after one or two days, you know where things are headed. And that's where you start trying some of these salvage treatments, I would say. May I add a short uh, comment uh, to this question also? There are Certain patients, I would say roughly half of the patients with an acquired form of TTP that primarily during the first, let's say, five to seven days seem to respond to the treatment. You see an improvement of the platelets. You see maybe an uh, improvement of the LDH. And then after some six, seven, eight days, you see a deterioration again despite a continuing daily plasma exchange and steroid treatment. And if you look in these patients with daily blood sampling at the ADMTS 13 activity and the inhibitor title, you can see in most of those patients having a exacerbation and um, a deterioration of their, uh, their TTP, maybe also together with a clinical symptomatology recurring, then you see in those patients a clear increase of the inhibitor title showing that the um, autoimmunity is kind of stimulated during the first few days of, uh, of mm-hmm. therapy. This is 
not well published. There are some anecdotal papers showing this clearly, but uh, I know about uh, several uh, data showing this, and our experience uh, from Bern would clearly show that about half of the patients show this phenomenon. We, and we've seen a similar phenomenon, I agree with you. Okay. Now, beyond plasma exchange, you've discussed the role of rituximab in treatment. How do you determine the right patients who would be a candidate for rituximab therapy? Uh, that and that to me? Yeah, that would, that would be yeah. to you. Sorry. Okay. Uh, a very good question. I, I, I think it's accepted that rituximab, for the most part, is safe. Um, we still have to keep our eyes open for longer-term complications. But I think the bigger issue in the determination is really going to be a financial one and expense. There's no absolute way of doing it. When we're selecting out patients for prophylactic therapy, whether it be rituximab at the time of the initial presentation or prophylactic cyclosporine therapy, as we've done in some patients, we will usually look for at least two uh, at previous episodes of TTP and severely deficient ADAMTS13 activity in remission that we think identifies a group of patients that is at risk because of the severe deficiency of the protease, but has also demonstrated at least twice before um, that they're more likely to do this again. That's the group we've identified um, to be more aggressive with at this point. Very helpful. And then there's also been a question about what do you do beyond that? So your patients aren't responding to plasma exchange. They're not responding to rituximab. At what point do you think about even more invasive therapies? Uh, what is the role for splenectomy? Um, is that an option? Why would that be an option if the spleen is not the only source of these autoantibodies? And how does that play into the decision making? Uh, Dr. Lumley, do you want to maybe start with that? Uh, could you repeat the question shortly, the, 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 the basic, you had many questions in, in one, I think. Yeah, I think the question gets at when, what, when does splenectomy fit into your treatment algorithm and why is splenectomy potentially beneficial? Okay, I mean, we have in Bern experience, and if you would look up the very first case of autoimmune ADMTS-13 deficiency published in blood in 1998, you can see here this is a patient having had a very severe disease caused with frequent relapses, I think three clear relapses during one year, and on day 365, the patient was splenectomized, and this is now 15 or um, maybe almost 20 years, I think, he is still in a complete remission. I mean, I would say splenectomy is an option in a patient needing more than three weeks of daily plasma exchange and, um, and uh, steroid treatment, maybe also including rituximab, um, um, or a patient having in, um, let's say, the first year or in the first six months, already a first uh, relapse when wind of uh, steroids. I think I would consider then um, a splenectomy to be a, a possible treatment. Dr. Catalan, any uh, additional comments on that question? Yeah, you know, one thing I'd like to add about the, the refractory um, the TTP. Certainly a lot of these refractory measures, the, the splenectomy, rituximab, immune suppressive therapy, are really trying to get at the inhibitor uh, and return that protease function. I think there is significant hope for these targeted therapies, the A1 domain blocking agents, that in theory should be able to block the formation of a microthrombi to prevent the microthrombotic complications that really are what leads to the end-stage the, the, the fatal outcomes, the cardiac issues primarily. So I, I think there may be hope in that these agents could block the formation of microthrombi, block further injury, maybe giving more time to use these same measures to decrease the inhibitor to return their protease function. If I may uh, add a comment, I do, of course, fully agree with you, uh, Professor Catalan. Um, this is a very useful possibility. However, using this a one-domain blocking agent be, uh, may be also somewhat dangerous if one does not consider that the disease process may still be active. There is still a severe, maybe autoimmune ADMTS-13 deficiency, and if you have a, um, a 
one domain blockade, you will not see the platelet clumping, but as soon as this drug is withdrawn, then you may still have a severe exacerbation, and I think this is kind of a danger. So I think um, uh, we have still to learn more with these uh, A1 domain blocking uh, agents before we oh. use them um, uh, in, the, in the clinic on a broad basis. Oh, I agree with you completely. I think these are complementary therapies. I think they work yes. together to accomplish the same means. I, you're exactly correct. Wonderful. And I want to ask one other question before we conclude. There have been uh, some questions about the components of the plasma exchange. Is there any data to suggest difference between using a cryosupernatant plasma versus a fresh frozen plasma uh, as far as their efficacy when uh, treating TTP patients? Uh, Dr. Kellen, do you want to take that first? You know, as far as the differences between cryo, uh, poor plasma, um, theoretically lacking of omelibrin factor as compared to the regular plasma, uh, I'm not aware of any data that says there's a clear difference. We've not seen the difference. Our institution have gone back to regular plasma in our patients. I'm not sure if Professor Lemme has uh, any thoughts. I would fully agree, and I think the most important thing of the plasma exchange is to give a lot of ADMTS-13 and to uh, neutralize the autoantibody at, uh, uh, waiting for steroids or also immunosuppressive agents to um, neutralize or to, uh, let's say, to uh, impair the uh, formation of the autoantibodies. And the fact that uh, um, plasma exchange is much more effective than simple plasma infusion is probably, in, in my opinion, mainly due to the larger amount of plasma you can supply. By the way, this is, uh, as far as I know, the only controlled prospective randomized trial um, published by the Canadian Aphoresis Group in 1991 in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing that plasma exchange is superior uh, as compared to uh, plasma infusion in TTP cases. Of course, this was before we knew about uh, autoimmune MTS of the indeficiency. Well, thank you both for uh, this very informative uh, and uh, educational webinar. I want to uh, thank you. I want to also thank everyone for attending. We hope that you found this webinar both educational and enjoyable. There have been a number of questions, and we've run out of time to answer them all on the webinar. We will be reviewing them and trying to answer them uh, in text and then sending them to you either via email uh, or posting them on the website. A follow-up email will be sent to all attendees with the webinar handout. Outs. And in addition to answers to the questions, we will also include an evaluation and a quiz that can be completed in order to get a certificate of attendance. As a reminder, everyone, our next webinar on women and coagulation disorders will feature Dr. Sarah O'Brien and Saskia Middledorp, and that will take place on September 24th. Please visit the ISTH website for details on how to register. And as a reminder, all of our webinar series, including this one, are available in an archive format at the website so that you can review them at any time. I want to thank you again for joining, and we look forward to seeing you next time.